everyone. I hope everyone's doing great today. Uh, there's a little bit of excitement outside, but I'm glad to see that ha that has deterred no one. Perhaps we shall invite the media up to uh, to, to hear our lovely panelists, some of our future panelists, uh, this afternoon. This is panel number three or four, because we had a little bit of a confusion there. But anyways, it's called Forms, and we're, it, today we'll be exploring shifts um, and explorations of forms of Irish grammar interfacing with folklore, forms of Irish music in the diaspora, and forms of nationalism and politics and austerity in Ireland. So I'll introduce our speakers uh, to you prior to their presentations. But please do hold your questions until the end of the panel. So first, we will be hearing from Sean. Oh, I'm going to screw up your name. I'm sorry. Fox. <laughs> Sean Fox. Yes. Uh, would you like to say it for us in Irish as you are the expert? Sean Makatoni. Your mother. Yes. Um, some of us here at Concordia are very familiar with Sean because he taught us some Irish. Uh, which is excellent. Uh, he's originally from County Kilkenny, Ireland. He graduated from Mary Immaculate College in 2009 with first class honours degree in the liberal arts and in 2011 he completed his master's thesis in Irish lexicography, um, mm -hmm. which went on to be published. His other research interests include oral history, dialectology and translation studies, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, in 2015, he co-founded Min Manra, a psychology and philosophy conference, and those proceedings were published and launched at the conference's second edition in November uh, 2016. And as I mentioned, also Sean has worked as a, an Irish teacher here at Concordia, but also as well at the University of Limerick, and he is currently doing a PhD in Irish folklore at Mary Immaculate College, so I'll leave it to you. Thanks very much. You're very informed. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> my talk this morning is encouraged, is a, has been encouraged, has been inspired by material collected from a West Kerry storyteller called Sean McCritton. And all that folklore that's been collected from him is going to appear in my thesis entitled Seanathus Hion the Critton, and the Scott Penathus Hion the Critton. That could be translated Sean McCritton's folklore best of. Um, I'm very grateful to School of Canadian Irish Studies for making my return to Montreal possible. I love Montreal. And this morning I'll be paying special attention to the different kinds of frames that were imposed on the folklore that was collected, including my own frames. My own frames are linguistic. I need to admit that at the start. <coughs> the first thing I'll do is explain the title. So, the evocative case on people's mouths. Um, that's a line from a translation of Sean O'Riordan's famous poem, Phil Elish, which very nicely summarised some of the factors that entice people back to Kerry again and again. Kerry is an Irish-speaking Gwaltaft region. So it's significant that Sean, the poet, appears to focus in on grammar as something that entices people back to a beautiful Gwaltaft region in the west of Ireland. Um, the grammatical evocative case that I refer to in the title <coughs> is a phenomenon where speaking at a person causes the, that person's name to change. So my name is Sean, as you can see here, as you could have seen a few minutes ago. When you speak at me, when you address yourself to me, my name needs to become a Hyon, as some of you know well. Um, this is one of the many challenges in store for learners of Irish. It's something that exists neither in, in French nor in English. And according to certain linguists, it's on the way out, even in Irish. This is why Sean O'Riordan was wowed by the vigour of the vocative case on people's mouths. That's to say, as a feature of a living, spoken language that had in endured independently of the written word. So, the seemingly oxymoronic presence of the phrase illiterate linguistics in my title comes from a reverence for grammar in these areas and the preference for the spoken word amongst the Irish-speaking community, both contemporarily and historically. So, I was careful in my last utterance in that I only went as far as talking about an apparent preference. We could have a debate about literacy until the proverbial cows come home. So, Vincent Morley had, a, had an article in the Irish Times recently, and he contributed to this debate about literacy, and I quote him here, um, although poems were most often transmitted by oral means in the 18th century, 
an active scribal culture existed. It might be expect expected that historians of 18th century Ireland would devote considerable attention to the evidence of vernacular literature, reflecting as it does the outlook of a numerous and distinct section of the population that had little or no opportunity to express its views. This has not been the case." End quote. So the Irish culture had in fact been marginalised in accordance with the kinds of views epitomised by S.G. Connolly, who said that compositions, the like of which we find in my folklore, should, should be considered as part of just folklore and not the politics of a society. So regardless of this passive silence or even active disregard on the part of the historians, it's certain that oral culture had traditionally enjoyed a very prominent role in Irish society, from political discussion to lawmaking and to literary output. So <clears throat> it's for this reason that the, the Free State Government of the 1920s embarked almost immediately on, a, on an ethnological project where the oral traditions of rural people were to be compiled with a view to saving the Irish ways. <clears throat> and the Irish ways is a quote from Michael Collins. Um, people like Michael Collins feared that these Irish ways were on the way out because of British colonisation. <coughs> a new post-colonial understanding of the Irish ways was to be provided by a variety of linguistic, political, religious clues available through folklore. So the vocative case that I referred to earlier in my title, that's an example of a linguistic factor that shows something about the Irish ways. But what exactly do bits and pieces of grammar tell us about a people? Wittgenstein said that the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Could a pedagogical use of the vocative case and other bits of grammar expand the minds or blow the minds of Irish people in the 20th century? Um, did the loss of a vocative case in other European languages limit the minds of other Europeans? Or does it just mean that the Gwaltaf people, Irish speaking people, are conservative for hanging on to this bit of ancient grammar for centuries? <coughs> so his Vladimir Prat, <coughs> it should be three P's in his name, sorry about that. Um, these are the kinds of questions that certain researchers have tried to force folklore to answer ever since Vladimir Prop um, published The Morphology of Folktale. And um, with his methodology, the folklore was able to pay attention to syntax and the smallest part of how stories are told. And before I talk more about syntax and things like that, grammar, things like that, I just want to talk about the context in which Sean McCritton, Sean McCritton's folklore was, was uh, collected. So the Irish Folklore Society was created in 1927, straight after the Free State was created. So that society was renamed the Irish Folklore Commission um, afterwards, 1935. And with the Irish Folklore Commission, full-time civil servant folklorists began to collect folklore from people in the West, mostly Irish-speaking Gwaltaf people. And in fact, um, in the end, they had collected from over 40,000 different storytellers, many of them illiterate. They even made audio recordings using the edophone, and it's an example of storyteller and civil servant folklorist there. It's actually quite hard to tell which is which. <laughs> 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 so the fruits of their labor have been stored since 1971 in the National Folklore Collection, which describes itself as home to one of the largest collections of oral and ethnological material in the world. <laughs> Visitors are invited to explore the large collection of books, manuscripts, audio recordings, contributed by any of the many thousands of storytellers, collectors, and correspondents over the years. The most prolific of these collectors, is on the right, um, the most prolific during 35 years of service contributed over 40,000 pages of handwritten transcription to the National Folklore Collection. And, um, at the end of his career, he was interviewed, and he mentioned two people as being the best or more prolific storytellers. One was my man, Sean McCritton. Another was the legendary Peg Sayers, <laughs> who you can see there with uh, <laughs> Frank and Bean. So, Peg Sayers has become synonymous with the Irish language in Ireland. And uh, one of the most... So that's Peg. Peg is famous. Peg has, been, Peg has received her credit and some infamy as well. Um, that's fine. 
Sean McCrittan is unknown. So one of the most recent publications on West Kerry folklore talks about how people like Sean McCrittan and Sean McCrittan in particular are unknown, which is sad. So um, one thing that I wanted to say as well is that <coughs> a reminder of Haig's supremacy in Irish folklore uh, does something to counter harsh feminist criticism that our folklore in Ireland is actually a male folklore, which might, might, might not be true. Not in my opinion anyway, and we can talk about that later if you like. Um, I guess to speaking, Haig's supremacy has also contributed to an imbalance regarding um, our understanding of Kerry Irish. So uh, Kerry Irish has arguably become conflated with uh, the Blaskets, which is where she lived for most of her life. And that's abandoned. The Basket Islands aren't even habited anymore. So we shouldn't imagine that Kerry Irish is synonymous with Blasket Irish when Irish still lives in Kerry, but when nobody lives in Blasket Island anymore. Um, Monsignor O'Fianachta, he was a Monsignor, priest, scholar, poet. Um, he founded a publishing house called Ernst Sagard, and he recently died last year. One of the last publications that he put out, he, he always wrote an introduction in the publications he put out. One of the last publications he said that a scholar needed to come along and address this dialectological problem in, with, as regards Kerry Irish. So I wanted to become that scholar <laughs> in my PhD. I decided to take up this challenge and to do one aspect of this overdue dialectological work with the help of Sean McCrittan and his folklore. And Sean McCrittan came from Kielmael Cheder, which you can see there, thanks to bloganim.ie, which is a fantastic resource for <coughs> toponymy, bloganim with the place names. And Sean McCrittan came from there, which is 17 kilometres northeast of Dunquin, where you can take a boat over to the baskets. So 17 kilometres is quite a lot in rural life. In terms of things, but in terms of it's not me. <laughs> it's me. Yeah. So, um, what I would have done with Sean McCrittan and his folklore is to hypothesize two separate dialects in this Kerry area, and that hasn't been done before in writing anyway. So, my, my research provides an example of how a shortcoming in one discipline can um, remedy or can even lead to new work being undertaken, actually. And as a PhD student, I became a beneficiary of the goodly services of the National Folklore Collection and I was able to listen to um, transcripts, I was able to look at manuscripts like this, um, all collected from Sean McCrittan, but all separate items collected from Sean McCrittan. I was able to look at these and transcribe them and also listen to audio recordings, which I think might work. So you can hear his voice. Okay, it's not coming up. That's not Sean McCrittan. That's the newfangled earphone which is used to, to record the voices of Irish storytellers. <coughs> so when we refer to items of tradition in folklore, we're talking about poems, songs, folk tales, and historical events of local importance. Um, the collection of items of tradition is a very important primary source for the historian, the linguist. This is an IPA transcription of some of the folklore of Sean McQueen. Um, it's also, these sources are also important for the folklorist, of course, the sociologist, the anthropologist, and loads of other ists. <laughs> the institutional frames that were placed on this material when they were first collected need to be discussed and need to be taken into account when you, when you use this material, no matter what ist you are. So, in contradiction to S.J. Connolly, who, who made this condescending proposition of a dichotomy between folklore and politics, um, folklore is not actually apolitical at all. Uh, folklore in Ireland allowed the colonised to write back. The finished folklorist, Perti Antonin, explains that folklore historically ha had a very important role in developing national identity, in national construction. And evidence for Antonin's opinion is, is found in the Irish context. So if we take, for example, a passage from the Handbook of Irish Folklore, 1942, um, there's a clear effort to establish stronger relations with Europe. I quote, In this material lies mirrored the routine of rural life of our ancestors, a source of inestimable value to the student of European ethnology. The literature of 12th century Europe is as fresh today as a thousand years ago in the tales of the Irish Veldt. <coughs> the, the legacy of this European cultural continuity is partly expressed by the fact that a story 
collected from Sean Critton, also told in the Basque country. The title of that story is The Priest Who Stole the Pig. There's also um, one of Sean Critton's folk tales have been translated to German and published in German by a German creative writer called Frédéric Hetman. And as well as that, um, another story has been collected from Sean McCritton and published in the same years in a, in a collection called Negro Folk Tales in Michigan. So international tales are an important part of Sean McCritton's repertoire and in all Irish storytellers' repertoires. So the internationality of the Irish folk commission is obvious, but it's also an institutional frame. And this frame played a part in deciding which primary source material was to be collected and which primary source material was to be published. A related frame was the institutional desire to distance the free state from the United Kingdom and aspects of its culture. And in fact, the Irish language folklore found in the Commission is still valued by people as not having many Anglicisms in it. So the, the kinds of comments made by lecturers in their <coughs> private correspondence with the head office need to be understood in this context. <coughs> so, one folklorist called Mr. O'Dowd wrote of Sean McCrane, and I quote, he never spent any bit of his life in school except for a few weeks, maybe. <laughs> Sean McCrane was consequently reported to be illiterate in the 1901 census. Um, there's no harm for him that he's illiterate, really. And Sean O'Dowd continued, no, he was never in school, nor his father before him, but that's not to say that their education suffered an iota for it. <laughs> Dowd noted that the foreign Protestant school was right beside the McCraden household and that they were to be commended for not succumbing to their education. <laughs> well, the main church beside Sean McCraden's house. Keel Malcader is what it's called. Sean McCraden may have been a proud Catholic with a slightly pejorative habit of referring to Irish Protestants as Sassanate which means English people, <laughs> but actual English people who figure in his stories are praised with references like, he wasn't such a bad fellow for an Englishman. <laughs> Nearly always, that sentence appears three or four times in the, in the corpus. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Sean had no hang-ups with the English language either. Uh, the Shanachies weren't, weren't shy of bringing English into the repertoire, and so, although Irish had predominated as a language in the Gaeltacht up until the well into the 20th century. Um, the tradition of macaronic song, which means bilingual song, has continued right into the 21st century. And one song called Ege Chorin Chul Mala, is Carrie Mishura, is an example of one of the mac macaronic songs that Sean McCrillin used to sing. The entire song is a conversation between a monolingual Irish worker and a monolingual English woman in the English speaking part of Ireland. And they're trying to fall in love, but they don't have a language in common. <laughs> the, so, this motif that I just explained was borrowed by Brian Friel in translations. And this is Yoland, English Yoland, and Moira from Donegal. Yoland only speaks English, Moira only speaks Irish, but they're falling in love at the end of the drama. And, uh, it's motif bar folklore. And I want to sing a song for you. So the song that Sean McCrillin used to sing ends like this. Shoo the garig is cashel no tail big is gallum shell hand it go mashum the bior Maris Bochelin das Misha Go Danuk my care lad come on the grass to very gum to good you Oh now my dear Johnny I know what you mean you are a great treasure, and that's a good trade. Before we get married, we'll travel away, and I hope we live married for the rest of our days. <laughs> <laughs> so, unlike the brave treasure from the psalm, Sean did speak English as well as native Irish, which sometimes had Anglicisms. And Mr. Mr. Dell complained that some of the sentences seemed a bit English. Anglicisms are beginning to infiltrate the speech of the old Irish speakers. But Sean certainly hasn't lost the old Gaelic prosody. So here are some examples of English words or anglicised Irish words. Mm -hmm. No, English words or Gaelicised English words in his folklore. Free all her, 
publican, ship all, wheel all, cry all, tend all, colonial, job air, spray ball, jug, pills, lady, rail punch, crack all, landlord, Scotchman. <coughs> They're all kind of sinister. Show me what next week is what you say in French. It's quite sinister, really. And I didn't pick out the words on purpose to make it look sinister. <laughs> it just so happens that many of the words involved are quite sinister. <laughs> So, one of, one of Danny's students, one of, one of the things that Sean O'Dell was talking about is how in Irish we can add the suffix oi to any English verb and then use it naturally. So that's where you have ship oil and things like that. <coughs> uh, one collector took the time to underline words like that in the text. Just underline, transcribe, and underline the English words. And this kind of attitude to English words naturally <coughs> used in Irish speech. Um, is an example of what Roger, Robert Hodges is talking about when he says about cataloging and classifying folklore, that classification is always a strategy of control. Control of people and what they should think, or in this case, what they should say and how they should speak. So, so the institutional aversion to anglicisms in the domain of Irish folklore was passed on to state lexicography, in the sense that words like practice oil weren't acknowledged in Irish dictionaries. Um, once a part of the ed educational system, the aversion to anglicisms was passed on to the people. So it came from the state down to the people. And uh, Paddy O'Malone has, a, has an anecdote in his book, The Hired of Wig. And in this book, um, we, we see an example of a person who has learned Irish in school visiting an Irish speaking area and as following conversation, which I've translated for you now. So the native speaker uses the word practice all, which is an Irish version of practice. Practice all, says the stranger. Sure, isn't that an English word? Be God and it's not, says Pied, up in his face, but a grand Irish word used by my family before us. But isn't the word clachta much better? And why don't you use that one instead, says the stranger. Now, as regarding having an interdisciplinary look on Irish studies, I can say that before this PhD in folklore, I did a master's on lexicography. And for anybody interested in lexicography, I'm giving a talk next week on basically what was the subject of my master's. Pres prescriptive lexicography is a compilation of dictionaries with a view to telling people how to speak rather than telling people how people speak. Telling people how to speak. So uh, prescriptive lexicography in the Irish context meant that these kinds of anglicisms were not taught in Irish classes. And it's partly for this reason that in my edition of Sean McGregan's Folklore, I've had hard work in making the text legible for everybody. One of the editorial techniques that I've implemented in trying to make these texts legible is by having glossaries. So I have a series of glossaries in my thesis. And like Catherine, I just wanted to say I have a whole chapter which is a, a catalogue of folklore, which took most of my time. The fun stuff doesn't. Yeah. The fun stuff that I'm doing now at the end of the PhD is only a few months, but I spent like, two years cataloguing the thousands of items of folklore collected from Sean McCrimmon. So, <coughs> my glossaries are going to mark the first, the, f oh, the first um, appearance of some of these words. And uh, I didn't notice you're telling me to stop. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to stop. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to stop there. I just to read a quote. I just wanted to say that. Uh, in terms of traditionary study, Ellen Sidhu said it's okay to have frames and biases, uh, as long as we admit to having them. So I'm going to admit to being from Kilkenny. <laughs> uh, I'm going to finish with a quote from a Kilkenny man. Really and it's an a quote, but it's interesting for traditionary study. And he said, A person of fine civilization knows that he cannot draw a perfect portrait of man until he is able to get a view of man in every state of civilization. And for that reason, he'll be able to, he will set due value upon any kind of research which will afford him a glimpse at man in any condition or any circumstances. Good morning.